Good morning. That's a nice segue for what I'll be talking about with the Tipping Points Project. So, um, my name is Candida Savage, but I'm representing a team of researchers, postdocs, and PhD students who've been involved in this Tipping Points Project. And I'd just like to also acknowledge shamelessly some posters and art exhibits relating to the Tipping Points Project, so please go and visit those. So when we talk about tipping points, we mean that these are these abrupt, surprising changes in ecosystem structure. And why they're surprising is often these small changes can have um, dramatic effects in terms of how those systems are structured and how they are functioning. And tipping points are common in marine ecosystems. They've been described in a number of different types of marine habitats across the world, and typically these are caused by more than one stressor. These types of studies have been looking in the past and using long-term time series to try and describe that a system has changed from one state to another. But can we move beyond this hind casting to actually try and look at whether a system is predisposed to passing that tipping point? So what is its risk to coming up to that tipping point? And we know that these ecosystems are dynamic, they're complex. So trying to understand that a system is predisposed to going through that tipping point is difficult. But the way we can do it is to try and look at whether there is a loss of resilience in that system. So is that system being predisposed to undergoing a tipping point? And to do that, we need to know how these systems work. We need to know the role that these organisms play in terms of driving ecosystem functions. We need to know how these organisms are connected to each other and to the biophysical settings. And we need to know how stresses, things like nutrient and sediment inputs, might be altering that structure and functioning. So one of the early um, previous research projects that has informed tipping points is this work where people were looking at um, turbidity as a stressor and using the Manukau Harbour to experimentally simulate shading in that system, which is um, representing turbidity. And what it showed is that with turbidity, you get a loss of those positive feedbacks. So there's a change in the architecture of those systems, which theory predicts would predispose that system to a tipping point. So can we now roll out that experiment at a national scale and expand it to not looking just at turbidity, but also looking at multiple stresses? And we know that New Zealand, um, two of the foremost threats that New Zealand faces are sedimentation and also nutrient inputs. New Zealand leads the charge in terms of nitrogen. Um, if we look at, compare New Zealand relative to other OECD countries, the nitrogen balance has changed more in New Zealand than any of those other OECD countries in the recent decades. So nitrogen inputs are increasing, sediment inputs are increasing. And we know a lot about those individual stresses in terms of how it changes the structure and functioning of these systems. But what about the interaction between those two types of stresses? Um, think of it as having two children. It's more than the sum of their um, parts, um, and that's largely because of those interactions. So sometimes these cumulative stresses have far greater consequences. And so trying to untangle those um, cumulative stresses is a challenge. And I see people smiling, so I know who've got more than two children. Um, so Tipping Points um, is truly a national scale project. The experiments were run from Northland to Southland. They involved iwi consultation across the country. And 22 sites from 15 estuaries were selected to represent a gradient of um, turbidity, and also where there was the presence of one of the dominant shellfish, these macamona, which we know from previous research is important for its role in sediment biogeochemistry. At each of these 22 sites, nine um, square meter plots were set up with controls, and then we added experimentally um, slow-release fertilizer that was added as in depth into these sediments at two different levels, medium and high low dose nitrogen. And then these systems were allowed to respond to that nutrient addition for more than seven months. Following the um, fertilization of those plots, a range of ecosystem processes and structures were measured in these systems. Um, I'm just showing you a slide there with just some of those processes. So we characterized biodiversity in these systems. Um, we looked at the bacterial community in these systems. 
as well as a range of ecosystem processes, things like the primary production, nutrient fluxes, and rates of denitrification. One of the tools that um, has been developed to look at these um, relationships in this structure, in the um, estuaries, are these interaction networks. And so what I want to just highlight, um, and I realize I've got quite a bit of time left, <laughs> what I'd like to just highlight are some of those results about these interaction networks. And that's what I want to spend some time talking about. So these interaction networks, um, they look these are the way forward if we're looking at more than just cause and effect relationships. We're trying to look at how these systems are wired, how they relate to each other, and how, whether those relationships were positive or negative. So I need to spend a bit of time explaining these um, slides to you. On the left-hand side are the clear estuaries, and there's seven estuaries that have gone into creating that interaction network. On the right-hand side, you have the turbid estuaries. There are eight of those that have gone into producing that interaction web. The Addition of the nutrients is shown in green there. Those, those were the treatments of control, medium or high levels of nutrient loading. And then we've also shown the dominant two bivalves, um, the cockles and the macamona, the wedge shells in those systems. And then the direction of those reactions and connections between that, um, those interactions are shown as red as positive and black as negative. And if we just compare those two um, types of systems, firstly what we see is that in the um, clear systems there are more connections and in particular there's more positive interactions in that system. And we know from ecological theory that systems that have positive feedbacks are more resilient. Once we start unraveling those positive feedbacks, we're predisposing a system to going through this tipping point. And so the first point to take home with this is that clear estuaries tend to have more connections and more positive connections. Secondly, um, the, the direction of those response to the fertilizing is different between clear and turbid estuaries. So in our clear systems, there's a positive relationship to some of these ecosystem processes. And I'm just highlighting one process there in terms of the benthic oxygen consumption. This is a emergent property that reflects um, a number of processes going on in these systems. It reflects partly the biodiversity, but also those um, species that you have in those systems. And the take home message from this is that that same stressor, in this case the nutrient addition, can have very different effects depending on the state that that estuary is in. Whether it's a clear estuary or turbid estuary, that stressor is going to have a very different effect in terms of um, its effects on the ecosystem processes. And a third point I want to do, um, just highlight is that these, um, the pore water nutrients, which are the measured pore water nutrients in that sediment, linking into the sediment biogeochemistry, in these turbid estuaries is, dis, is decoupled actually from that interaction network. So how these systems are functioning and how they're actually um, connected together is fundamentally different. And so, how can we use this information to inform ecosystem-based management? Ultimately, what this kind of research is doing is it's helping to, us to understand the dynamics of that ecosystem. It's trying to understand the architecture of those systems. And what happens if we dial up pressures or we dial them back? And so ultimately, what we want to do is go beyond this um, situation of hind casting a tipping point is happening um, which often happens by surprise, but trying to actually um, predicate when a system is predisposed to going through that tipping point. And we need to understand what drivers um, enhance the resilience of those systems, and basically, um, what are the effects of having those multiple stresses in terms of predisposing that to that tipping point. Another reason um, we need to understand these dynamics is these feedbacks establish um, processes which are harder to break. So when we're looking at recovery of these systems or recovery from degradation, trying to break those feedbacks and understand the lag responses or that hysteresis is critical for being able to understand how long it will take before any implemented management is going to have um, consequences for that system. Um, 
And so I'd just like to acknowledge um, this is tr truly a multi-organisational team of people um, that have been involved from Northland to Southland, a number of um, postgrads, um, PhD students and postdocs, as well as researchers from throughout the country. So I'd just like to thank them and the um, Sustainable Seas have funded this project. Thanks.